Thank you. Um, so the topic uh, that I uh, wanted to uh, talk about uh, today is um, the combination of uh, blockchains and this um, kind of area that has existed in kind of academia and in practice for about 50 years uh, called uh, mechanism design. And mechanisms are something that we've had in different forms for a very long time, but it is um, an area that kind of more and more people are starting to be interested in. I mean, both in the context of blockchains, but also uh, separately from blockchains. And I think that there are a lot of uh, kind of interesting uh, synergies between these two areas and how blockchains as a technology can help implement many kinds of mechanisms, be a uh, testing ground for many kinds of mechanisms, and what the limits of uh, blockchain technology are in this area. So, there are many kinds of mechanisms, right? A yeah, mechanism is um, kind of fundamentally anything where um, you have different people who are participating and these different participants have the ability to uh, make different decisions and these decisions affect the um, allocation of resources. So this could include voting, and voting both for national elections, also inside of corporations, shareholders voting, um, voting even inside of blockchains. Um, it includes auctions, um, it includes markets, exchanges between uh, different cryptocurrencies, including decentralized exchanges, which have uh, become a very kind of a, a larger and larger topic recently. Um, in Ethereum, um, ENS, which is uh, Ethereum's kind of decentralized alternative to the uh, domain name system, um, is also a mechanism. You can, um, ENS actually has auctions inside of it, it has fees inside of it, it has a lot of kind of economic and uh, game theoretic uh, components to it. So, there's recently been kind of more and more interest in applying mechanism design and more broadly in society, right? So, I mean, things like exchanges, auctions, markets have existed for thousands of years, but um, there has been a lot of mathematical research in the last kind of 50 to 100 years on how to actually construct these uh, mechanisms so that they can have kind of more optimal properties and kind of better properties than the simplest ones that we have uh, that we have had for millennia. And there's these mechanisms can be used for allocating goods. They can be used for kind of incentivizing the production of public goods. So incentivizing the production of things that are very valuable to not one person, but to kind of entire communities. Um, they can be used for um, kind of coordinating behavior in different ways. Um, there was this interesting book called uh, Radical Markets by Evelyn Wilde that goes into some interesting ideas that cover kind of part of some of the like, very interesting and new things that you, can, um, that you can do with this kind of math, but no, by no means the entire space, right? So, um, one of Glenn Miles' very new ideas is this uh, kind of idea of radical liberalism, which is this uh, fancy name for a um, mechanism, but it's kind of an extension of quadratic voting that um, is designed for determining how much funding can go to kind of nonprofit projects. Right. So the idea is that if there um, are different kind of nonprofit projects that provide value to large groups of people, but the amount of value that they provide to each person is relatively small, so no single person has the incentive to pay for the project by themselves. Right? So in these kinds of cases, like um, a market by itself can't pay for it because there's no single person that wants to pay for it. And so the main ways that we have uh, for paying for public goods right now is by relying on kind of large corporations, governments, and uh, similar kinds of um, institutions. And but the idea here is um, that if we suppose that you have some kind of source of funding, and this could be a government, this could be a charitable foundation, this could be a, a company, it could be anything, then how do you kind of take that funding and 
optimally allocated across different kinds of projects. We, if you assume that the person providing the funding by themselves has no idea which projects are good. Right? And the idea is that you allow other people to make donations, but then you use this kind of special formula to magnify the donations that other people make. Um, quadratic voting is kind of a similar idea for voting. Harper taxes. There's been a lot of uh, kind of development in making markets and exchanges uh, and kind of ways of trading between um, assets more efficient. So frequent batch auctions are one kind of very interesting new development. And this is um, something that people are kind of very interested in because um, a lot of financial markets right now have this problem that you have, um, be, uh, because a you know, kind of centralized financial market is this kind of race where um, you have different participants and they're all kind of sending um, orders in and canceling orders and trading with each other very quickly. And so this creates large incentives for people to spend very large amounts of money on purchasing kind of you know, like basically cables that try to make their connections to an exchange as fast as possible. And so you have these kind of microsecond level high frequency traders. And this actually kind of burns um, quite a lot of resources. It causes quite a lot, like billions of dollars every year to be wasted on just work that's totally unproductive for society. And frequent batch auctions are kind of one fairly slight redesign of existing markets that can actually just solve this problem. Right. Um, automated market makers um, starting to be in use on blockchains as well. Combinatorial auctions, so making it more efficient to exchange between more than two different kinds of assets. So all of these um, ideas are ideas that have been kind of thought about by a combination of kind of academics and people looking to apply them in the real world. And like even outside of blockchains, I think there is um, a lot of value from uh, these ideas. Um, so how can uh, blockchains help in all of this? Right. So there is this um, concept of uh, mechanism uh, credibility that uh, people in uh, the mechanism design space are sometimes concerned about. And the, the issue with uh, mechanism, uh, mechanism credibility is basically that if you have some mechanism, so it could be an exchange, it could be an auction, it could be one of these um, voting systems, one of these um, radical liberal uh, kind of gadgets, then problem is that you have to trust this kind of central party to actually operate the mechanism correctly. And in many cases, you can, uh, with um, a lot of the mechanisms that are kind of the most efficient, if you can rely on this um, entity to, to run correctly, actually tends to be fairly inefficient if you assume, admit the possibility that this central operator will cheat. Right? So in many of these uh, kind of mechanisms, there is this uh, very significant trust problem. And the trust problem just is that if you have one central server running these mechanisms, then first of all, there are fairly large opportunities for that central provider to cheat. And also, a lot of this cheating is undetectable. Right? And so if the cheating happens, you can't even necessarily tell whether or not the cheating took place. So um, immediate use cases um, for kind of uh, blockchains, and, or for mechanism designs on, on blockchains in particular. And I kind of stress blockchain use cases in particular because I think one of the kind of big sources of value that the blockchain space can provide to the world as a whole is as being a kind of testing ground for these new kind of economic and social technologies. It includes things like decentralized exchanges, includes things like funding uh, public goods uh, in uh, blockchain ecosystems. So this could involve funding uh, base layer uh, kind of development. It could include funding things like documentation, tutorials, community resources, layer two protocols that are useful for many participants in a blockchain. Um, auctions can be used for things like selling virtual real estate, right? So, I, like 
over the last you know two years, there has been a lot of uh, kind of interest in blockchain projects funding themselves by selling tokens, so ICOs. And I actually think there has been too much interest in ICOs relative to other things that these projects could be selling. Right. So one example of another thing that you can sell is kind of advertising space on on the interface for some app. Another example could be selling domain names. And another example could be kind of selling badges. So some of these other models, I think, are kind of relatively underused. And in many of these cases, the mechanism design can help in kind of creating mechanisms that both kind of increase revenue for the seller and increase efficiency for the buyers and for the community as a whole. Right? So in all of these cases, though, the problem is this issue of mechanism credibility. So basically, if the mechanism is run in a centralized way, you have to trust the central party. But we in the blockchain space do not like trusting central parties, right? Who here likes trusting central parties? Okay, not many. So, what what are some of the kind of challenges if you try actually implementing these mechanisms on a blockchain, right? So. One of them is kind of minor or validator manipulation. So the problem is basically that single block proposers, so either miners or proof of stake validators, whoever chooses what transactions to include in a block can attack many kinds of mechanisms by choosing what transactions to include. And this is a problem, for example, in kind of on-chain uh, decentralized exchanges. Um, it's even a problem for um, on, on decentralized exchanges built on top of technologies like Plasma. It's a problem for auctions. Um, ICOs, in particular, um, and actually have yeah, ran into very serious uh, problems of this kind. And we saw last year that some ICOs where the mechanism was kind of very badly constructed ended up leading to these kind of zero-sum games where participants would pay transaction fees of over $10,000 to get their transaction included faster. So basically, we ended up kind of accidentally replicating what happens in the real world with uh, billions of dollars being burned on, like, on an HFT, but on the blockchain. We don't want to do this, right? Uh, the goal of blockchains is to try to kind of make the world more open and fair, and not to burn billions of dollars uh, of dollars of resources for uh, for no good reason at all. So, one solution to this is this idea of frequent batching, right? And what frequent batching means is that instead of having mechanisms that kind of look at transactions in order and really care what comes first, what comes second, what comes third. You can accept transactions kind of in batches across several blocks. So you can say block number 123, 124, 125 are one batch. During those three blocks, we will just wait for transactions. And then at the end, we will kind of process those transactions in some standardized order. So it could be kind of highest price to lowest price, um, some order that does not depend on which block they were included in. And so, if one of the block proposers is malicious, then as long as one of the block proposers within a batch is honest, the mechanism would still kind of would work the way it is intended to work. Another challenge is privacy. So, in, you don't kind of see this assumption made very explicitly in a kind of mechanism design or game theory textbooks, but these mechanisms very often tend to assume that the information that gets submitted into the mechanism is completely private, and the only thing that you see is kind of what happens on the outside, right? The only thing that you see is basically what happens, uh, like what is the, what is the result of the computation, and blockchains actually do not provide that much privacy, right? So one solution of this is these kind of commit reveal schemes where if all you want is sort of temporary privacy, like if you study the mechanism and you realize only temporary privacy is important, then you, you have this mechanism where participants kind of submit hashes of their transactions, submit commitments to what they are going to do first, 
And then in the second stage, they're required to reveal what their actions were. Now, if you're not comfortable with this idea of requiring participants to reveal and penalizing them if they don't reveal, you could also use threshold decryption, you can use VTFs, you can use different kinds of cryptography to accomplish this. Another solution to privacy is zero knowledge proofs. Um, one third challenge is kind of the, the civil problem, right? So, quadratic voting, for example, require, and radical liberalism too, requires every single participant, every single human participating in the mechanism to have only one account. And if a participant can give themselves many accounts, they can give themselves kind of unfairly very large benefits, right? You can make as many votes as you want at very low cost. So this is kind of hard to solve, but some solutions could include kind of centralized identity oracles. So you could have kind of institutions, banks, potentially governments, creating like basically lists of which public keys actually correspond to uniquely different people. You could do kind of social verification where you use the graph of existing kind of social connections between people to try to uh, figure out who is a unique human and who is not. But so this is still a kind of a very active problem. Um, challenge four is collusion, right? So in any voting system, and this includes um, kind of uh, anything that happens on the blockchain, theoretically in any of the votes that have happened on blockchain so far, anyone can kind of bribe other participants to vote. So anyone can say, I will pay you $10 if you vote in the way that I want to vote. And you can, by doing so, you can basically kind of, through other participants, make, vote, make as many votes as you want at a very low cost. So preventing collusion, preventing vote buying and vote selling it requires making it impossible to prove how you voted, right? If you cannot prove how you voted, then if I tell you, if you vote for um, X, I will give you $10. But you want to vote for Y, you could say, okay, I will vote for X, but then you can vote for Y, and then you can tell me, oh, I voted for X, and you can still collect the $10, but I would not be able to tell that you cheated, right? So if you make it impossible to prove what someone voted for, then you can kind of solve the collusion issue. One solution to this is some um, MPC, multi-party computation. So with the multi-party computation, you can make it so that no single participant learns any private information from the uh, computation, which could be any kind of mechanism, except for the final result, right? Um, another solution is, of course, trusted hardware. But trusted hardware has been kind of attacked quite a bit recently, right? So if you have to choose between one of these two things to rely on, then relying on kind of trusted hardware is much better. Oh, sorry, relying on multi-party computation is much better, and relying on trusted hardware, I would say, is probably quite dangerous, especially if you're doing something of high value. Simplicity is important, right? So if you can make a mechanism that does not have to rely on identities, private information, trusted hardware, multi-party computation, if you can build something that just uses a blockchain, then this is great, and this is the best. Sometimes you can't, right? But if you can, then you should. So conclusions, right, is that the mechanism design, including these some of newer these newer voting schemes, quadratic voting, things like this kind of radical liberal mechanism for allocating resources for uh, public goods, frequent batch auctions, all of these new kind of auction and market designs, is a rapidly growing field, and it's a field that there is kind of a lot of interest in. And it's clear that some of that these uh, kind of newer mechanisms that people are coming up with are, in many cases, considerably more efficient than what we had before. Um, and with a lot of these more complex mechanisms, however, you you have this very strong assumption where you're relying on the central operator to kind of be honest and run the mechanism correctly. Blockchains can help solve some of the trust problems in mechanism design, but they can't solve all problems. And so blockchains should be used kind of correctly and in the right kind of combination with other cryptographic technologies. 
And between these two things, I, uh, between blockchains and cryptography and kind of offline uh, um, solutions, offline oracles of different kinds, then you actually can kind of really significantly in, uh, it reduce the kind of trust barriers to uh, actually uh, implementing many of these technologies in practice. So thank you.